four sitting United States presidents have been killed. Abraham Lincoln in 1865, by John Wilkes Booth, James A. Garfield, in 1881, by Charles J. Guito, William McKinley, in 1901, by Leon Cholgosh, and John F. Kennedy, in 1963, by Lee Harvey Oswald. Additionally, two presidents have been injured in attempted assassinations. Former President Theodore Roosevelt, in 1912, by John Flamin Schrank and Ronald Reagan, in 1981, by John Hinckley Jr. In all of these cases, the attacker's weapon was a firearm. James Abram Garfield, was the 20th President of the United States, serving from March 4, 1881, until his death six months later. He was a lawyer and Civil War general. Garfield served nine terms in the United States House of Representatives and is, to date, the only sitting member of the House to be elected president. Before his candidacy for the White House, he had been elected to the U.S. Senate by the Ohio General Assembly, a position he declined when he became president-elect. Garfield was born into poverty in a log cabin in November 19, 1831 and grew up in northeastern Ohio. After graduating from Williams College, he studied law and became an attorney. He was active in the Stone Campbell Movement denomination. President James Abram Garfield was assassinated by Charles Julius Guiteau in 1881. Charles J. Guiteau had followed various professions in his life but in 1880 had determined to gain federal office by supporting what he expected would be the winning Republican ticket. On one occasion, Guito was unable to finish his speech due to nerves. Guito, who considered himself a stalwart, deemed his contribution to Garfield's victory sufficient to justify his appointment to the position of consul in Paris. Despite the fact that he spoke no French, nor any foreign language. One medical expert has since described Guito as possibly a narcissistic schizophrenic. Neuroscientist Kent Keel assessed him as a clinical psychopath. Charles J. Guito was born in Freeport, Illinois, the fourth of six children of Jane August and Luther Wilson Guito, whose family was of French Huguenot ancestry. He moved with his family to Allow. Wisconsin, in 1850 and lived there until 1855, after his mother died in 1848. Soon after, Guito and his father moved back to Freeport. Guito inherited $1,000, equivalent to $30,000 now from his grandfather, as a young man and went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, to attend the University of Michigan. Due to inadequate academic preparation, he failed the entrance examinations. He crammed in French and algebra at Ann Arbor High School, while receiving numerous letters from his father about his progress, but quit before completing the program. In June 1860, he joined the Oneida community, the utopian religious sect in Oneida, New York, with which Guito's father already had close affiliations. According to Brian Resnick of The Atlantic, Guito worshipped the group's founder, John Humphrey Noyes, once writing that he had perfect, entire and absolute confidence in him in all things. Guito considered himself a loyal Republican and a stalwart, and convinced himself that his work for the party had been critical to Garfield's election to the presidency later convinced that Garfield was going to destroy the Republican Party by scrapping the patronage system, and distraught after his final encounter with Blaine. He decided the only solution was to remove Garfield and elevate Vice President Chester A. Arthur, an acolyte of Senator Conkling, the stalwart leader who managed Grant's 1880 campaign and who was not on friendly terms with Garfield. Guito conceded that the president would be too strong to kill with a knife, stating, 
Garfield would have crushed the life out of me with a single blow of his fist. He settled on a gun after contemplating what weapon he would use. Guito felt that God told him to kill the president. He felt that such an act would be a removal as opposed to an assassination. He also felt that Garfield needed to be killed to rid the Republican Party of Blaine's influence. Borrowing $15 from George Maynard, a relative by marriage, Guito set out to purchase a revolver. He knew little about firearms, but believed he would need a large caliber gun. While shopping at O'Meara's store in Washington, he had to choose between a 442 Webley caliber British Bulldog revolver with wooden grips or one with ivory grips. He preferred the one with the ivory handle because he thought it would look better as a museum exhibit after the assassination. Though he could not afford the extra dollar for the ivory grips, the store owner dropped the price for him. He spent the next few weeks in target practice. The recoil from the revolver almost knocked him over the first time he fired it. Guito's weapon was recovered after the assassination and given to the Smithsonian, but it has since been lost. On one occasion, Guito trailed Garfield to the since-demolished Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station as the president was seeing his wife off to a beach resort in Long Branch, New Jersey. But he decided to postpone his plan, because Garfield's wife Lucretia was in poor health, and Guito did not want to upset her. Having been alerted to the president's schedule by a newspaper article, on July 2, 1881, Guito lay in wait for Garfield at the railroad station, getting his shoes shined, pacing, and engaging a cab to take him to the station later. As Garfield entered the station, looking forward to a vacation with his wife in Long Branch, Guito stepped forward and shot Garfield twice from behind, the second shot piercing the first lumbar vertebra, but missing the spinal cord. As he surrendered to authorities, Guito said, I am a stalwart of the stalwarts, Chester A. Arthur is president now. After a long, painful battle with infections, possibly brought on by his doctors poking and probing the wound with unwashed hands and non-sterilized instruments, Garfield died on September 19, 11 weeks after being shot. Modern physicians familiar with the case state that Garfield would have easily recovered from his wounds with sterile medical care, which was not common in the United States until a decade later. While Candace Millard argues that Garfield would have survived Guito's bullet wound had his doctors simply left him alone. However, Garfield's biographer Alan Peskin stated that medical malpractice did not contribute to Garfield's death. The inevitable infection and blood poisoning that would ensue from a deep bullet wound resulted in damage to multiple organs and spinal bone fragmentation. Once Garfield died, the government officially charged Guito with murder. He was formally indicted on October 14, 1881, on the charge of murder, which previously had been attempted murder after his arrest. Guito pleaded not guilty to the charge. The trial began in Washington, D.C., on November 17, 1881, in the Supreme Court for the District of Columbia. Guito's trial was one of the first high-profile cases in the United States where a defense based on a claim of temporary insanity was considered. Guito vehemently insisted that while he had been legally insane at the time of the shooting he was not really medically insane, which was one of the major causes of the rift between him and his defense lawyers. The judge gave the jury instructions based on the Emneton test. Guito was found guilty on January 25, 1882, and sentenced to death. After the guilty verdict was read, Guito stepped forward, despite his lawyer's efforts to tell him to be quiet, and yelled at the jury, saying, You are all low, consummate jackasses. 
Guiteau was hanged on June 30, 1882, in the District of Columbia, just two days before the first anniversary of the shooting. While being led to his execution, Guiteau was said to have continued to smile and wave at spectators and reporters. He notoriously danced his way to the gallows and shook hands with his executioner. On the scaffold, he delivered a last dying prayer in which he declared that God did inspire the act for which I am now murdered and predicted that this government and this nation, by this act, will incur the eternal enmity, adding that thy divine law of retribution will strike this nation and my murderers. He also excoriated President Arthur as a coward and an ingrate, whose ingratitude to the man that made him and saved his party and land from overthrow has no parallel in history. Then, as a last request, he recited a poem that he wrote that morning about 10 o'clock, called I Am Going to the Lordy, which he had written during his incarceration. He had originally requested an orchestra to play as he sang his poem, but this request was denied. As per request with the executioner, Guito signaled that he was ready to die by dropping the paper. After he finished reading his poem, a black hood was placed over the smiling Guito's head and moments later the gallows trapdoor was sprung, the rope breaking his neck instantly with the fall. Guito's body was not returned to his family, as they were unable to afford a private funeral, but was instead autopsied and buried in a corner of the jail yard. Upon his autopsy, it was discovered that Guito had the condition known as phimosis, an inability to retract the foreskin, which at the time was thought to have caused the insanity that led him to assassinate Garfield. Charles Julius Guito was 40 years old at the time of his execution. Thank you for watching Death Row.